The Challenge of the Yukon. It's King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the North Country, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On you huskies! Gold. Gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the greedy race for riches. Now back to the days of the gold rush when Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, King, battled through storm and snow to preserve law and order as they met the challenge of the Yukon. A strong ice-flecked wind whistled in the darkness around the cabin near the outskirts of Dawson. Its fury seemed to enhance the cozy comfort of a blazing log fire that beat back the cold and threw a rosy light on Pat Daly and Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police sitting before it. At the Mountie's feet lay a huge silver-gray dog. Pat stretched comfortably and smiled at Sergeant Preston. Uh, it's sure nice to have you here with me, Preston. These winter nights get lonely. I couldn't think of a better place to recuperate, Pat. You're good company. As well as being the finest cook I know. I wish they'd always give you a short rest between cases like this. Oh? I'd like to have you come me oftener. Well, I'd like the rest, too. But if I have to be shot to get it, it's rather a high price to pay. Uh, and now you're going to tell me how you got that bullet in you. You promised the whole story as soon as supper was over. Sure, Pat. It was one of the weirdest cases I've ever had. The inspector told me the facts before I started after the criminals. Old Ben Weeks had a gold claim on the Klondike River about 40 miles from Dawson. It was a rich claim, and Ben was a hard worker. So very seldom went to Dawson, and his only friends were a couple of trappers in his territory. One day as he went back to his cabin from his gold claim, he saw two strangers in the path before him. One was a big man with red hair and a bushy red beard. The other was a half-breed. Ben was a friendly old man, always happy to have company. Well, good evening. How are you? You're strangers around here, ain't you? Can't remember seeing you before. I'm Ben Weeks. I'm Red Wilson, and this is my partner, Chico Pete. Howdy. We're thinking of settling somewhere in this territory. Plan to do a little trapping. Well, there's lots of room around here for newcomers. Ain't many trappers up in this neck of the woods. We're going to town and get some more supplies. And maybe we can build ourselves a cabin near here. Well, I'm going to Dawson day after tomorrow. Maybe I could bring some back for you. I got a good dog team, and I'll have some room on my sled day coming back. Do you uh, go to Dawson very often? Nope. Just a few times a year. Well, we'll see what we can do at the trading post at Moose Crossing first. If we need anything they haven't got, we'll let you know. Would you like to come up to my cabin and have some supper? No, thanks. We got to get going. Come on, Chico. Well, be sure and let me know if you need anything. And drop me in after you settle. We'll do that. <laughs> we sure get that information without much trouble. You sure him take gold to Dawson? That's the reason he goes. He banks his gold there. Takes a load of it in four times a year. We could go to his cabin. Get it now. He's probably got it hidden where we'd never find it. Day after tomorrow, he'll have it all packed on the sled. We can use his dog team, too. Day after tomorrow, we'll be waiting on the Dawson Trail for him. It'll be a lot easier for us that way. This rug. You kill him? Sure. He got enough dust to make us independent for life. Get ready, here he comes. <laughs> Those dogs, Chico. I'll have a look at him. I got him on the first shot. <laughs> yeah, he's done for all right. Let's have a look at the stuff on the sled. He's good, dog team. Yeah. Help us get away from here. Yeah, there ain't many supplies on this sled. But here's what we're after. Bags of gold. Must be a month's work. We go north now? Nah. We gotta load up with food first. There's a trading post about five miles ahead. 
Now that we got plenty of money, we'll buy some good blankets and equipment and get out of these parts fast. We bury body, huh? Ah, uh, we ain't got time. Come on, it's almost dark. Nobody will be on the trail now. The wolves will take care of old Ben Weeks for us. What? What you have? What? Chico and Red headed for Sandy McMillan's trading post at Moose Crossing. It was dark when they reached it, and they found more than they'd expected when they entered Sandy's store. Sandy was talking to Corporal Dick Rogers of the Mounted Police. When they saw the Mountie, Red and Chico paused at the door, but it was too late to turn back. Hello. Anything I can do for you? Well, yeah, we want some supplies. Come on, Chico. I'm Corporal Rogers. You men trappers? Yeah, we're planning to be. We're just starting north. You want about two weeks' supply of food? Yeah. And uh, I'd like some blankets, too. I don't remember seeing either of you around here before. No, we came up from the south. I thought when I heard your dog team that you were the mailman. He was due here early today, but he ain't showed up. Uh-huh. He'll be along yet, Sandy. Nelson never misses his schedule by much. That's the dog team. But that's Nelson now. Uh, with, which way is he coming from? He's coming from the north. The regular trail. Uh-huh. Hey, Sandy. Hello, Nelson. Come on out and help me. We just found old Ben Weeks on the trail. He's been shot. Oh, hello, Corporal. You found Ben Weeks shot? Yeah. This looks like a shot for you. Uh, Come on, Corporal. We'll get him into the back room. Right, Sandy. Where about you, sir? Yeah, them fine men you shoot. Good. We run away? Uh, quick, see if there's a lock in the back room door. Get the key if there is. I have key. Did you notice whether there's a window in that room? Just a small one. We've got to get the men there and lock them in. What? The Mountie. I'm going to have to take care of the money. Quiet, here they come. I thought you were dead at first, but you were still breathing. He's right in this back room. There's a guy. Oh, careful, boy. He's badly hurt. Yeah. All right, watch this door there. Yeah. You stand by the door, Chico. I'll get the money out here. We better go. He said Ben wasn't dead. If he gets conscious, they'll know we're the ones that done it. Get by that door and lock it after the money gets out. I don't like it. Uncle Rogers! Uncle Rogers! Come here, quick! Look, look what I found. Must have dropped out of that man's pocket when you brought him in here. What did you find? What is it? Say, why did you... Oh, uh, that takes care of I'll bring the money together and the supplies on the counter. Chico, take your knife and cut the traces on the mailman's dog team. Cut the harness on the money's team, too. We don't want him to follow us. We do. You hurry. Uh, I got it. All right. Hurry up, Chico. on the floor. Corporal. The dirty colors. They shot him. Is he hurt bad? He's still breathing, but he's unconscious. They were the ones that shot Ben Weeks. They knew Rogers would get him unless they killed him. Think I better take my dog team and go after him? You can't do it alone. Anyway, we've got to take care of the Mountie and Ben. I'll get some bandages. You take his tunic off. It looks as if the corporal's hurt worse than Ben. Those dirty cowards. You better do what we can for Ben and Rogers. Then you get to the Mounted Police Headquarters as fast as you can and report this. At least we have a good description of them. So, Chico and Red got away. Nelson and Sandy couldn't leave Ben and Corporal Rogers to go for help. Red and Chico got a full night's start. Ben Weeks pulled through, much to everyone's surprise. But Corporal Rogers died that night. Red had shot him at close range without giving him a chance. Nelson, the mailman, reported the case to headquarters... and Inspector Grayson called me in. King, as usual, was at my heels. Good morning, Sergeant. Good morning, Inspector. Ah, that dog of yours never seems to get far away from you, does he? He's practically my shadow, sir. Down, King. <laughs> Down, boy. Well, you've trained him well. Oh, uh, Sergeant, I suppose you've heard most of the details of Corporal Rogers' death, haven't you? Yes, sir. I talked to Nelson after he reported to you. You were quite a close friend of Rogers, weren't you? Yes, Inspector. We were very good friends. So I thought for that reason you might want to take over the case of Chico Pete and Red Wilson. Thank you for thinking of it, sir. Nothing would please me more. Good. Now, Nelson reported that the trail led south. He followed it until a snowstorm covered it. We have very good descriptions of both men from Nelson and Sandy McMillan. One is a half-breed. The other is a big man with red hair and beard. I'll find them, sir. I should put another man on this job with you, Sergeant. There's no one available right now. Would you like to have a special constable? I'd uh, rather start out alone with King, sir. If I need a constable, I'll appoint one later. 
If I can, I'd like to do this job alone. I know how you feel. But you must remember that these two men are ruthless killers. You know, of course, that the mounted police will will be after them, and we'll never give up. Yes, sir. From what Nelson told me, Sergeant, I think your best bet is to start looking for them near Selkirk. They'll need supplies. You should be able to find someone in a trading post that's seen them. I'll leave at once, sir, and uh, thank you for this assignment. Good luck, Sergeant. I'm sure you'll need it. It took over two weeks to find any trace of Chico and Red. I spent some time in Selkirk and then scoured the surrounding territory, asking every prospector I saw, checking with trappers, and stopping at every trading post. When I returned to Selkirk, I found that Chico and Pete had been there while I was gone and had learned that I was after them. Nobody had seen them leave town, but they weren't in it. I was very discouraged when I came into the lobby of the hotel that night and started for my room when I suddenly heard the cheery voice of Pierre Bonnet, a French-Canadian trapper who lived near the town of Selwyn. Sergeant! Sergeant Preston, bonsoir. Well, hello, Pierre. What are you doing here in Selkirk? Me? I have made some money with my trapping. I come here to have some fun. Oh? Selwyn is uh, the too small place. Pierre is sick of it. Well, it's nice to see you, but I'm afraid I don't feel much like celebrating. Oh, you are troubled? I'm on the trail of two murderers, and I'm not doing a very good job of finding them. Pierre, you know just about everybody in your town. Have you seen anything of a half-breed named Chico and a man with red hair and a red beard? Anybody like that been in Selwyn? A man with red beard, you say? Yes, big man. Yesterday on the trail, when I come to Selkirk, I see such a man. Huh? He's on the trail to Selwyn. Was he alone? No, I, I don't think so. But I don't see the other one. He go off into the woods when Pierre come around the bend in the trail. They wouldn't want to be seen together. Hmm. Did you talk to them at all? <laughs> I, I try. But this man, he's not very friendly. One of these dogs was going lame, and he was very mad when I tell him the dog should not be made to work with such bad foot. You're sure he had a red beard and red hair? Mm, his hair I could not see, but his beard, we, oui, she's red, and he has very hot temper. So maybe the hair, she's red too, eh? Well, it's worth a try, I guess. I'll take the trail to Selwyn tomorrow morning. Mm. Sergeant, why don't you stay in my cabin? I am here. Nobody uses. Why, thanks, Pierre. I'll do that. You remember? He's on the far edge of town. Yes, I remember where it is, Pierre. Thanks a lot. He's pleasure, Sergeant. For Pierre is no trouble at all. I got to Selwyn late the following night and went straight to Pierre's cabin. It was in a lonely spot outside the town, but it was very comfortable. I spent the next two days trying to pick up some information about Chico and Red. But nobody in town had seen them. No one like them had been in the trading post to get supplies, so I began to think that Pierre had imagined the man with the red beard. I decided I'd leave Selwyn the following morning and went back to Pierre's cabin that night, completely discouraged. I was sitting alone before the fire, getting a little drowsy, when King began to whine and pace the floor. I went to the door with him to let him out, and when I opened it, there stood one of the biggest men I've ever seen. He was six feet six and correspondingly wide. In his fur parka, he looked like a big grizzly bear. King growled, fur on his back rose. Oh, hi, King. Well, I, uh, I guess I didn't hear your knock. I didn't knock. Did you want to see me about something? Are you what they call a mounty? Yes, I am. I, uh, just letting my dog out. Oh, he's a nice dog. Let him go out. I want to talk to you. All right. Come in, sit down. Go on, King. Go on, Papa. Are you in trouble? I want my dog back. Your dog? Did you lose him? You've got him. What? What are you talking about? I want him back now. But what kind of a dog is he? I don't know what you're talking about. They said you'd say that. They? Who? If you don't give him back, I'll kill you. Now, listen. I've never even seen your dog. I haven't got him. You're lying. 
They said you'd lie. I'd be glad to help you find him if tell you tell me where he is, or I'll get you now. But I can't tell you where he is. I don't know. You know, but you won't give it Just to me. Just a minute. Me. Let me talk. I'm going to kill you. I was in a bad spot. My gun was in its holster on the cot behind this man. He came toward me slowly like a big black ape. I gave him a smashing blow in the face, but it was like hitting a stone wall. He didn't even stagger. His fur parka protected his body, and in spite of anything I could do, I felt his hands on my throat. With the last bit of breath I had, I yelled for King. I don't know why, because he was outside and the door was shut. But just as everything went black, I heard a crash of glass, and as if it were far away, I heard the roar of King's attack. No! No, don't bite me, no! Go away! Back! Go away! Fear for King kept me conscious, I think. That man could kill him easily by hitting him with a chair or choking him with those hands. I grabbed the edge of the table and pulled myself up. I still couldn't see, but I could hear King growling and tearing at the man who had tried to kill me. Then, when my vision cleared, I saw him. He stood in the corner, a chair in front of him, holding King off, not hitting him. His big hands dripped blood, and King had torn the front of his parka to shreds. The man's face looked hurt and worried. I found my voice at last. King! Back, fella, back. But watch him, boy. He bit me. He's the first dog ever bite me. You didn't try to kill him, did you? No. I wouldn't hurt a dog. Dogs like me. I like dogs. That's why I was mad at you. You won't tell me where you hid Jock. Jock? Jock is my dog. Why well, didn't take Jock? Can't you see, man? This is my dog. Why would I want your dog when I have this one? This dog likes you just the way Jock likes me. He broke through the window to help you. Well, that proves he's my dog, doesn't it? That proves I didn't take yours. Well, yes. Yes, I guess that's right. Your hands are bitten, man. You'd better let me fix them. Jock would have done what your dog done if if someone tried to kill me. Of course he would. Down, King. Back, fella. It's all right now. Oh, uh, sit down beside this table now. Got some bandages for those hands. He's a good dog. I like your dog. What's your name? Martin. Grizzly Martin. Grizzly Martin. Well, let's have a look at those hands, Grizzly. Mm -hmm. You uh, live around here? Yeah. Me and Jock. That is, till he went away. We live all alone. We never see people much. They were the first ones for a long time. They? Who? The men who said you took my dog. They came two days ago. They wanted to buy Jock. I told them I'd kill anyone who tried to take him. Then the next day, Jock was gone. They told me a Mountie took him while I went to town for them. Well, how did you know where to find me? The people in town knew you were here. I asked them. Those men who said I took your dog... Now, what do they look like? One was white. The other was part Indian. Did they go to town at all? No. They didn't want to. Hmm. They gave me money to buy things for them. And then they gave me money to buy tobacco for myself. I see. Do you live far out of town? Yeah. Me and Jock, we live way back in the hills. Nobody ever finds us. These men did. But now they've gone away. I knew then what had happened. Red and Chico knew that I was on their trail, and by chance they'd found Grizzly back in the hills where they were hiding out. Because he was weak mentally, he was easy to fool. He was childish and harmless, except for that one thing, his dog. Chico and Red hoped that he'd kill me, and they're plan had almost succeeded. I kept Grizzly with me that night, and the next morning we started early to see if we could pick up the trail of Red and Chico. I questioned Grizzly on the way to his cabin. Grizzly! 
Do you know from which direction those men came to your cabin? They came from where the sun set. Oh? Well, we'll look over the country west of here. There was a snowfall yesterday. We should be able to pick up their tracks. I think they're the ones who stole your dog. I'll kill them if they took Jock. Would you know Jock's tracks if you saw them? Sure I would. Jock is bigger than any dog I ever saw. And his front paw is twisted. He got it caught in a trap once. One of their dogs went lame, I think. They must have needed another one. We're lucky we'll pick up their trail. Unting! Unting! We were lucky. We found their campsite to the west of Grizzly's cabin in the hills. And there were tracks in the fresh snow. As Grizzly bent over them, he became wildly excited. He began shouting and waving his big arms. They've got Jock! Here's his track! They stole him! They're making him pull their sled! I'll kill them! I'll kill them! They stole Jock! Hold on, Grizzly. Don't get so excited. Calm down. I'll kill them, I tell you! They took Jock! I'll get Jock back for you. Now, I want you to go back to your cabin. Go home and wait until I come back. No! I'm going to catch them! They took Jock! No, Grizzly. You must go back and take care of those hands of yours. My hands don't hurt anymore. I'll kill them. I'm going to find them. Grizzly, I can't take you with me. It may be days before I catch them. You can't go. I won't let you. You can't stop me. Oh, yes, I can. I have this gun, see. Now, don't make me use it. King won't let you hurt me. You can trust me, Grizzly. I promise you I'll bring Jock back. They're bad. They'll kill you and take your dog, too. I can take care of myself. Now, please go back and stay there. I'll bring your dog back with me. Well, they took Jock. They made... Grizzly hesitated, and then, muttering to himself, he turned and ambled toward home like a big Kodiak bear. I watched him leave and started in the other direction on the trail of Chico and Red. On trail! On Chico and Red were headed west. I knew they were planning to cross the mountains to the border of Alaska. But to do this, they had to break a fresh trail which slowed them down. They hadn't had much of a start, and my dogs were fresh, so I knew I could catch them. I reached the mountain trail the next day. It was treacherous and heavy going for the dogs going up and around the mountain. We'd reached a point where the trail was narrow. A slope ran down from the side of it and ended in a sheer drop of two or three hundred feet. Suddenly, as we rounded a bend, King gave a sharp bark. At almost the same instant, a gun went off. I felt a stinging pain in my right shoulder that spun me around. As I fell, I heard King attack and saw him go over the side of the trail, rolling down the slope in a snarling heap with the man who had shot at me. My right arm was helpless. And I tried to struggle to my feet as I fumbled with my left hand for my gun. And then I heard a voice beside me. Stay still, Marty. This time you die. Chico. Your dog may be killed red. Now I kill you. Do not reach for gun. How'd you get back here? We see you from upper trail. We come back, wait at Bend. Now see this gun, Monty. I'm going to shoot you right now. I'll never be closer to death than I was at that moment as I stared into the rifle barrel of Chico, the half-breed. He enjoyed my helplessness and waited a moment, looking at me with his small, beady eyes like a snake before it strikes. And then suddenly, from around the bend behind him, there loomed a massive figure... It came soundlessly and swiftly, and Chico screamed in terror as Grizzly Martin picked him up like a sack of flour and hurled him over the slope. Grizzly! Uh, he's dead now. He went over the brink. How'd you get here? I came after you. I knew they'd kill you. Where's King? Did he go over the ledge? No. He's got the other one beside the edge of it. Now I'll kill the other one. No, Grizzly. Help me first. I'm shot. Get me to my sled. I'll carry you. Oh, you can't, man. I'm too big. I can't. Be careful. It's my right shoulder. There. I never saw a man as strong. Now I kill the other one. Grizzly, wait. Stop. I'm going to kill him. No, Grizzly. He's my prisoner. He knows where Jock is. If you kill him, you won't know where to find your dog. I must find Jock. If you do as I say, you will. Get Red up from the side of the slope, man. If he's hurt... Carry him. But first, get my gun out of the holster for me. There it is. Thanks. I'll call King off and you get Red, but don't hurt him. He better tell where Jock is. Careful now, don't slip. 
Back, King. Come here, boy. Let him up. Grizzly will help you from up here, Ed. Good boy, King. Oh, thank the Lord. You didn't go over that cliff. Stay close to me, fella. Where's my dog? Where's John? He's, he's all right. Don't hit me, Grizzly. All right, Fred. Where's your dog, Dean? It's up here around the bend of the trail. Is Doc all right? Sure, sure he's all right. Please, Marty, don't let Grizzly or that dog of yours hurt me. Are you hurt much? Can just, you walk? Just bruised. I can walk. I'll take you to Jock only. Don't hurt me, Grizzly, huh? Lead the way, Red. I don't think you'll try anything with King and Grizzly behind you. I'll follow on the sled. I'm Let's going. Go. Only keep those two away from me. We went up the trail to the place where Red had left his dog, Dean. Jock, Grizzly's big dog, was hitched to the sled. And that was when I needed my gun. Grizzly took one look at Jock and turned on Red. It was wild with fury. You used to whip on her. You hit him. His head is cut. I'll twist your neck off. No, I did it with Chico. Stop it, Grizzly. Let him go or I'll shoot. Get back, I say. But he hurt Jock. They hit him. Get back, I say. It was Chico who hurt him. I'll have to shoot you, Grizzly, if you try to kill Red. And if I kill you, there won't be anyone to take care of Jock. He'd be lonesome without you. But, yeah. Yes, he would. Come on, Grizzly. Get these dog teams turned around. You must help me, Grizzly. You must help me get home. Well, Pat, that's the story. I had no trouble getting back. No trouble, you say? Bringing in a murderer with only a dog and, and, and Grizzly to help you. And a bullet in you besides. No <laughs> trouble. Well, it wasn't exactly a picnic. But Red was so afraid of King and Grizzly that he did everything I told him to, and he didn't try to get away. And what about Grizzly, Sergeant? Did you turn him in? Grizzly had saved my life, Pat, and I felt that I owed him his freedom. But ain't it dangerous, letting him roam around? Oh, he's perfectly harmless if no one bothers his dog. Of course, this story has spread around by now, and I'm sure that no one will ever try it. Grizzly and Jock live alone in the wilderness together. They don't see much of civilization. And so... So King saved your life twice in this assignment. Mm -hmm. He certainly did. Ah, he heard me say his name. Look at him, will you? Putting his big paw on your knee. Hello, fella. I believe he's trying to tell you he's bored with his quiet life. Is that it, old boy? You missed the excitement? Well, don't worry, King. We'll soon be back on the trail again. Challenge of the Yukon, a copyrighted feature, is brought to you each week at this time, and all characters, names, and incidents used are fictitious. Listen again next week to another exciting adventure during the days of the gold rush. L. Prow speaking. This program came to you from Detroit. When was the War of 1812 fought? This question is a sample of what not to expect on Break the Bank, the famous quiz show heard over most of these ABC stations every Friday night. But then, neither do the questions require the contestant to have the knowledge of a nuclear physicist. No, the posers are of general interest. For example, a contestant recently was asked to name the South American capital that's located on the equator. His answer, Quito, the capital of Ecuador, broke the bank for $3,170. You can easily see that Break the Bank is the biggest money-paying quiz show in radio. Its jackpot always contains at least $1,000, and it's worth much more most of the time. Naturally, there's plenty of suspense when that big money question is asked. Suspense for the contestant, suspense for the studio audience, and suspense for you, too. So here, break.